So the first thing I want to show you today is lazy, an example of a lazy sort algorithm where the laziness, lazy evaluation invents an efficient algorithm. So I'm going to show you a regular program, quick sort, sorting algorithm, and we want to make it lazy, and the lazy version will be extremely efficient. It's a new algorithm, and I'll show you how it works. So this is important because we're going to go step by step through this algorithm so you see exactly how the, the laziness only does what it needs and that this can really make things much, much more efficient. Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to do today. The second thing is a little bit more theoretical. We're going to try to explain what is declarative concurrency exactly. So we saw deterministic data flow, functional programming, lazy programming. So what is common for all of those? Why are all of those special? What makes them declarative? Why are they all functional? Huh? So we saw sequential functional programming. We saw deterministic data flow. We saw lazy version of this. So the question is, what's common? So this will be kind of a theoretical discussion. I will present to you exactly what it means. And so that when you program something later, you have some way of foundation, some way of understanding really what it means. So what is in common between all these things? So this is going to, this is part of going to be a little bit more theoretical. So I sent a message on the Moodle giving you the sections of the book for this. So this is actually section 414. Okay. And then I'm going to give some more discussion on all declarative paradigms and the different languages that do them. So there's many programming languages that some of them maybe you never heard of them but that are used by many people and that are different kinds of declarative language. This is section 452. So this will give you kind of an overview of the whole spectrum of declarative paradigms, okay? So let me start now by talking about lazy quicksort. So let me first explain the quicksort algorithm. So you saw already sorting algorithms, eh? algorithm de tri. So did you see, who has already seen quicksort? Do you know quicksort? No? You know merge sort maybe? So quicksort is a sorting, an efficient sorting algorithm. So, which is n log n normally, and it's kind of uh, a different approach from merge sort. So it's all also an interesting algorithm by itself. So let me explain how it works. It's a recursive approach. It's kind of divide and conquer approach. So I, I have a list here. Let's say I have a list L, and I want to sort them. So these are all elements. Okay, and I want to sort them in increasing order. So the way quicksort works, it first you do a partition. Uh, so you pick an element x, and this element is called the pivot. So this can be any of those elements. And you take this list and you split it into two lists. One which is all elements less than x, and the other one is which is elements greater than or equal to x. Okay, let me call this L1 and L2. 
So that's very easy. So this is, can be done in order n time. Huh? You just traverse the list and you make two lists. And then you do recursive call. So you do recursive call quick sort here and here. And you create two sorted lists. Two recursive calls. And once you have these two sorted lists, you just have to append them, concatenate them, since all the elements of S1 will be less than the elements of S2. So here you have an append. And then you get the F final sorted list. So this is very easy kind of algorithm. It's, it's a divide and conquer. Huh? You divide the original list into two lists. And then you, you sort the two lists recursively with quick sort. And then you append them. So the append is also order n. So the total time for this will be upper bound of n log n. Okay? So it's similar to merge sort. So this was one of the first very efficient sorting algorithms that, found, that was found. Okay? It's okay, it's reasonable. So I can we I can we I'm show an example of this. So for example, if I have to list seven, three, two, eight. Let me pick this list because we're going to use it later also. 732864196419. Let's take the first element as the pivot. Then we have the elements that are less than, so 3, 2, 6, 4, 1. And here we have 8, 9, or 7, 8, 9. Then we do two sorts here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then you append these two, which just gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? I want you really to understand this algorithm, because when we make it lazy, it's important to understand how it works, because the laziness had, will be working on this execution. Okay? So let me first now uh, show you this algorithm. So here's the partition L, X, L1, L2, and it takes L, it takes the first element of L as the pivot, and it takes all elements that are less than the pivot, puts them in L1, and the elements that are greater than or equal go into L2. Okay, so that's Straightforward. Okay, so here in this example, I have three, seven, six, four, eight, six, five, seven, three. So the pivot is going to be three. Okay. Sorry, the pivot, I have taken four as the pivot. So all elements less will be put in three, in three, three, and the others, seven, six, four, eight, six, five, seven. You see, it's just, it's very simple. Huh? So I'm showing you this very simple thing so that you can understand better what happens when it becomes lazy. Okay, now I will do the append. So this is a standard append, except that I mark it lazy. That means if I have functions computing the two arguments, it will only execute them if I need them. So if I only need the first element of the result, it will only compute L1, okay, and not L2. So that's a lazy append. And then the final thing is the lazy pixel <coughs> itself. Okay. So here is a lazy quick sort. So the body is very simple. It takes a list L. Okay, it takes the first element of this list, X. It partitions whatever the list is remaining, M, so into L1, L2. It does two recursive calls. And then it appends the result with X. So because the X is not inside of M, it has to put the x in between, you see. At first, L, S1, and then x followed by S2. 
So this is very straightforward algorithm. Huh? Okay, let me compile it now and run it. So here's an example. I'm going to sort this list. And of course, you know what's going to be displayed when I run this, huh? So what's this going to display now? Huh? Tell me. What's going to be displayed here? Sorry? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, well, an unbound variable. Huh? So basically no result. So there. So that's the lazy thing. So in order to force the computation, I need the result. So to need the result, I have to ask for elements of x. So for example, I could ask for s.1. Okay. Uh, um, there. So that will display two, and the first browse, which is still active, displays two and with the rest is underscore. So that's the smallest element. Okay. And if I want more elements, I can display more elements. So this is the second element, which is also two. And we also do the third element, which will be three, and so on. So each time I ask for another element, I get a little bit more of the list. So somehow, the lazy computation is doing part of this work. But the question is, exactly what part is being done here? And it turns out, it's very interesting. It's the part is going to be really minimalist. Okay, It will only do uh, a very small part. And in fact, the complexity of the algorithm is incredibly much better so then the original quick sort. So let me first tell you what the result is. So the original quick sort, if I do the whole list, it will do n log n computations. Okay? Whereas the, the lazy version will do n plus k log k, where I am asking for the k smallest elements. So if I only ask for one element, the smallest one, it's going to be order n, because this is going to be like small constant. Huh? If I ask for two elements, it will be n plus 2 log 2. But if in general if I ask for k elements, it will only do, it's like it's sorting only k elements. Instead of sorting everything, n log n, it's only sorting the ones that I need, plus an overhead of n. Huh? There's an overhead of n, but this is a linear overhead, not n log n. Which means that I have now an algorithm for giving me the k smallest elements out of n. Okay? So that's nice, right? Actually, this is very powerful. One of the things is, K is not known in advance. If I ask you to write an algorithm that gives me the two smallest elements of a list, you will have a small, two variables, will store the two smallest ones, and you go across the list. Fine. If I ask you to write an algorithm that gives me the three smallest elements, then you will have a small vector of three elements, you traverse the list, and you put the three smallest ones in there. But if I'm not asking you for k, where I don't know the value of k, in fact, when I run this algorithm, I can keep asking for elements, and it will keep giving me more and more of the smallest elements. So if I were to ask you to write an algorithm that does this, how would you do that? It's not so easy, huh? I want to ask you now to write an algorithm that gives me the k smallest elements out of n where I do not know k in advance. 
So for example, I can keep asking for elements until I reach a certain value. So the k is not known in advance. It's only known when I'm asking. And I still want my algorithm to be efficient. That's not so easy to do, okay? In fact, it's quite hard. And I'm not even sure you, you, you did an algorithm like that. It's a very incremental algorithm, okay? So that's what the lazy algorithm gives me. So how does it work? So I'm going to now explain to you how this actually works, okay? So this will be, I will do this on the board, okay? We're going to do like a theoretical analysis of this lazy code, and I'm going to show you how it executes. So you really understand where the power of the laziness comes from. So it's, it looks, if you look at it like this, naively, it's kind of magic, yeah? You go from n log n to n plus k log n. How is that possible? It's like a magic. You just put lazy, put the word la keyword lazy there, and you immediately have a super efficient algorithm. How does it work? Well, in fact, it all comes from the laziness we saw last time. There's nothing extra. So I'm going to explain the magic, okay? So let me, uh, so now we go, I'm going to do some, do it more theoretically. So that's all, that's all the code I'm going to show, but I will show code on the board now. Okay, so I'm going to explain how the magic works. This is actually my biggest critique of all the Harry Potter books, huh? They have magic. They never explain how it works. Okay. So I'm going to explain here how the magic of the lazy evaluation actually works. So you have the algorithm in your head, huh? Because you have to understand the algorithm to understand how the laziness will attack it and make it and make it work efficiently. So let me give you the, the actual lazy quick sort of function here, because we're going to look, look at it. Fun lazy. Case L of x bar m, then partition m x L1, L2. S1 is equal to L quick of L1, so these are the two recursive calls. L2, and then we have here L append. S1, X bar S2. The other is the nil case. Nil, then nil, and end. Okay, so this is important. So I'm going to show, keep this on the board, and this is the body. So I'm going to put a box around it. So this is translated into another form, which I will put here. A procedure. L quick L R, where I show the result. I have now a thread. I do wait needed. R. The result. Then I have R is equal to the body and n. Okay. So this rectangle is the same as this one, huh? This is the body. This is this whole body. So that's it. Huh? That's all what the laziness is doing. Now let's see what happens when I do a computation on this. S is equal to L quick, let's just do, so I pick a list that actually makes it clearer, so I'm going to use the list that I have here, 7328-6419, like this. So this does nothing, but then I'm going to do browse s.1. So the dot operation on s 
needs the value. So dot is an operation with two arguments, uh, the, a record or a list and a, a field name. So it needs the arguments. So this will cause the weight needed to continue. Okay. So what's going to happen is, is that this body, this body here, will be executed. Okay, okay, let's do it. This will execute the body of L quick. Okay, because S is needed. So here it is, the body. Let me forget the case, because let's do a little bit. We know that the L is this big list. Huh? So the case will take the first element and the rest. So let me just show you this piece, okay? Because it's going to execute this part. Partition. And the, the list M is going to be 3, 2, 8, 6, 4, 1, 9. The X value is 7 as the first element, L1, L2. Then I have S1 is equal to L quick L1. S2 is equal to L quick L2. And then I have the result. This append here is the result, huh? Is this R. So I can actually write it like this. The result here is S, huh? S is equal to L append. Of oh, S1, X bar, S2. So X is 7, huh? Put a 7 here. That's it. So that's what's going to run now. Huh? So I will, this browse will cause this to be executed because of the way it needed, huh? So what's going to happen? The partition is not lazy. Partition is a regular procedure, it's not lazy. So it will execute completely, and it will create L1 and L2. So the L1 will be 3, 2, 6, 4, 1, and the elements less than 7, and L2 will be 8, 9, okay? So partition will execute completely. Now what happens to these two? So S1 is L quick of L1. This will actually create a lazy suspension. Let me uh, erase this so I can say it here. So basically, it's going to do weight needed of S1. Huh? The L quick, it's going to do a weight needed of the result. Huh? It does a weight needed of the result. It's this translation. Huh? So this is going to do a weight needed of S1, which will suspend. So this will create a lazy suspension. Okay, and the same here, weight needed of S2 will create a lazy suspension. What about the, the lazy append now? The lazy append is going to do a weight needed of S. So what's going to happen here? Oh. Well, I already woke up. Huh? S is needed in L quick here. Huh? So again, in order to get the value of S, I again, I call now a weight needed. So this is the weight needed that's inside the lazy append. Huh? So what's this going to do? You tell me. Weight needed S. What does it do? You tell me. Nobody wants to say something? I'm doing S.1. It's the same S as here. Huh? It's the result. Huh? So this is going to not wait, yeah? Wait for someone to ask for S. It's going to ask for S, exactly. This weight needed is not going to block. Okay? It will not block. Not block. It will execute the body. The body of L append. So this will execute the body of L append. So you see how the, the weight needed, the S is part of this body. Huh? So 
Again, we have an await needed, and it will not block because we need S.1. We still need S.1. It's still needed, okay? That doesn't change. So this is connects you to body of depend. Well, let me write down the body of depend now. Case S1 of H bar T, then H bar L append T. Uh, it's S2, no, because the argument, sorry, it's set 7 bar S2. I'm filling in the actual arguments, huh? S1, so in the definition I have L1 and L2, but it's S1 and 7 bar S2. Seven bar S two. So the nil case when the first element is empty. So this is the body of a pen. So what is this going to do? I actually have a case now. S one of H bar T. That's going to need S one. Huh? S one is needed here. But not S2, uh, only S1 is needed. But I have a weight needed of S1 up here, which has suspended and a weight needed of S2. Uh. So S1 is needed. So that means this, this lazy suspension will wake up. But the second one will not wake up. Okay, so basically I'm going to execute the body Of, of S1 is equal to L quick L1. Okay? Basically, this first call, uh, I'm going to execute that body, but not the second one because I don't need it. So you see how the, the need actually propagates. Huh? It starts by needing here the L quick, and then it needs the L append, the S. And here now, I'm the uh, S1. So this S is causing S1 to be needed, okay, in the body. So now I need S1. So the body is going to be executed again. So let me write it in small here. So this is going to do partition of, but what's the argument? What's S1? Sorry, it's going to be the partition of, um, of L1. Huh? It's L1 here. So what is L1? So I erased it, but L1, we know it here. L1 is going to be 3, 2, 6, 4, 1. But in fact, I'm going to remove, remove the first element. So this is the L1. Huh? I'm going to remove the first element, which will be the pivot, and the rest is M. So this will give me 2, 6, 4, 1, 3. And let me call this one L1 prime, L2 prime. This is also L1 and L2, but it's in the recursive call. So just to make sure there's no confusion, I'll call it L1 prime, L2 prime. And I will have S1 prime is equal to L quick of L1 prime. S2 prime is equal to L quick L2 prime and I will have again okay now I have uh, S1 so here I have S1 huh, is the result so S1 is equal to L append of S1 prime 3 bar S2 prime Okay, so this is what's going to be executed here. And more lazy suspensions are going to create it. So this one will create a lazy suspension. This one will create a lazy suspension. But what will this one do? So here I'm going to do a weight needed of S1 inside the L append. And to execute the body of the L of 10. 
Well, S1 is needed, huh? This one will not block. So you see how the laziness is picking things to execute, huh? So this will cause the first L quick to activate, but not the second one. This one stays suspended. And it will keep going like that until the list gets very small, okay? Uh, at the very end, so what's going to happen at the very end? So at the very end, the, the list L is going to be empty, and there will only be this element <coughs> left, uh, the completed <coughs> element. And that will be the smallest element. So we're going now recursively down this, this part, huh? and the second part will stay suspended. So you see how things are moving down, huh? Okay. Okay, so you're seeing how it works now. Now let me make a picture of the whole thing. Just a picture to give you a general idea of how it's working. Let me start by L. Huh? So there's an X in the beginning, huh? I will now do partition. Let me make this one a little bit wider, like this. So there will be L1, L2. Now, this one will stay suspended, but this one will again do a partition. Okay. And then this one will, this is L1 prime, L2 prime. This one will stay suspended, but this one will again do a partition. Like this. Okay. Eventually, this, will, this one will find a result. This will do the append. Okay. This one is not executed. This will do another append. So this is again, this is um, S1 prime, but the S2 prime, I don't have it yet. I don't care. I'm only worried about the beginning part. And then I have this part here, which is going to be S. Uh, which is S1 and S2, but I don't have S2. Uh. There's nothing on the, that part. So you see what it's doing? Each time I go recursively down, it's completely executing a partition. So this is N, N over 2. Uh. And then, uh, so until it goes down to one element. So the partitions is going to be N plus N over 2 plus N over 4, etc plus a very small number. So this is going to be 2n. It's proportional to n. That's the amount of work done by the partition. Huh? The appends are not going to do any work proportional to n, because it's, I'm only interested in the first element here. Huh? Now, if I need more than one element, two or three, if all the elements I need are in this part, uh, if L1 has, let's say L1 has four elements, and if, I am, if I'm asking for three elements, that means all the elements I need are in here. That means S2 prime will never be executed. The, the, the append will never exhaust, will never finish the S1, and it will never ask for S2. Okay? So you can see that the amount of work I'm doing, it's like a smaller version of the whole algorithm. Uh, a smaller version of the quicksort in a smaller list. So that's how I get k log k. The k log k is what's happening inside here. Uh, so basically, I keep going down, and if I ask for more elements now, maybe I ask for four, five, six elements, then I will move down in this list, and eventually the L append will exhaust S1 prime, and it will need S2 prime. And then I go up one level. Huh? Then I'm going up one level here. But only one level up. Huh? But then if S2 prime is exhausted, then I will actually have to go up another level. So it's only calculating the minimal part of the sort. Okay? And it knows that all these elements are the smallest because of the partition. Huh? 
All the elements in L1 are less than L2, huh? So it knows that these, that all the elements in here are the smallest elements. Okay? So you see how it's working? So this is, this is an analysis. You see how the lazy algorithm works. Now when you write the lazy program, you don't have to worry about all that. But you can, you can imagine intuitively that the laziness will only activate the part that's needed. So because of the append here, it will first activate S1 before S2. So it's going to cut the problem down, 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 okay? So this kind of analysis, huh? if I give you a small lazy program, huh? I expect you to be able to do this. Huh? This is actually, it's actually not complicated because it's just using the definition of laziness we did. Huh? You see, there's no magic. The magic is explained here. Huh? So what do you think of that? Huh? So you see, the laziness is actually doing something very smart. Huh? It's picking only the things that's needed. And if you write your algorithm in a nice way, where you separate the different parts, then the laziness will only use the part that it actually needs. Okay? You see that? Okay. So, okay, so that's the, the lazy quick sort example. What do you think of that? It's nice. So laziness actually is a very powerful technique that you can use in any programming language. Huh? You just have to divide up the work into pieces that you need, but don't compute them until you actually need them. Okay? Now, if you have a language that supports laziness, like here, in Oz I have a support for this, but other languages also support laziness, like the most famous one is called, a language called Haskell, okay? This kind of language will automatically do this for you. So that means, as a programmer, it's very easy to use, okay? So I show you the analysis here, because this is a, a university course, and, and so you are supposed to understand the things that you do. Huh? It's not just a cookbook, recipes, and so on. Huh? Okay, so that's all for the laziness. So uh, the next part is going to be the declarative concurrency. But let me make a break now, because it's 9.20 something already. So I think it's good to make a break. So now I want to do a little bit of a theoretical investigation. I want to answer this question. What really is the declarative concurrency? Now, I first, I want to refresh you on what it means to be declarative. So remember, we saw functional programming. And all functional programs can be written as lambda expressions. Okay. Okay, so don't worry, I'm not going to go completely into lambda calculus, but I just want to explain the principle. So the power of functional programming is that maintenance, testing uh, is much easier. Okay, analysis of programs is easier. So functional programming is the basis. And we have a very important result called church roster theorem. Okay? So assume that you start with some expression. E, uh, E1, some expression. This is any functional program, huh? And you reduce it. Okay? And you reduce, and you get some other expression. Let me call it EB. But the church roster says that if you take this one and you reduce it in a different way, in different order, that these two actually are equivalent. So you can actually keep reducing and keep reducing. <coughs> you can 
come up with the same one. That means if you reduce an expression, any order, you get this one. If you reduce an expression in a different order, because it can be concurrent, huh? so this is like deterministic data flow, you could always keep going to end up with the same thing. So this, we say that the lambda calculus is confluent. That's another way of saying this. Huh? Confluent, the word means that it flows together. Huh? So no matter which order you, you reduce, you will end up with the same result. The result of a computation is the same no matter what order it's done. This is the theorem. This is why functional programming is so powerful, why it's so nice. Okay, it's because of that. Okay, so that works for sequential functional programs. Okay, but we have more than that now. Uh, we have, uh, let me, uh, we can have streams. So we have uh, concurrent streams, concurrency, streams, okay. So streams, it means that the program is never done, okay. So concurrency means that we have many activities, but that's okay. Uh, this lambda expression can, can model concurrency. But how do we model streams? How do we model streams? And we also have data flow variables. We have data flow computation. So we can have unbound variables. So when we do functional programming in this classical way with lambda calculus, we don't have streams and we don't have data flow. We have an expression and we reduce it. Huh? A functional, a function calls and we reduce and that's it. Huh? So this can be concurrent, that's okay, but it doesn't have streams and it doesn't have uh, the data flow. Okay, so basically, let me, uh, the first one, the first problem is the streams. So let me explain what it means. So basically, let me call this partial termination. So we have a program here, and it has input stream as one, and output stream as two. Okay, so this is a, like an agent. And let's say the input stream is one, two, and the output stream is doubling. So we have a stream program. But the program is never done. It's never finished, because this stream can always be extended. Uh, two, four, six, one, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight. So this one will never, will never terminate. So it's not this like this where the program actually terminates. I have one expression which terminates. But here it never terminates. Okay? So basically what, what we have to do here that we have to say there is a concept here that's called partial termination. So we have to figure out how we can express this in the language of functional programming. Because here we never have termination. So in order to solve that, we assume we can introduce a concept called partial termination. So the program terminates, but temporarily, okay? So that means if S1 does not change, it's fixed, then the output S2 reaches a final, a 
final uh, value, okay? So the idea is that if the S1 is 1, 2, and it stops, then the output will eventually, this program will terminate, and the output will be 2, 4, okay? And th so that's, that's actually a temporary termination. So this is what I call partial termination because it's only temporary. There's also, it's also called, uh, in the theory, it's sometimes called a resting point. So when the input stops changing, so when the stream is fixed, and you let the program run, then the output will eventually also stop and terminate, okay, and give a result. So then we have like a functional program. One, two, will give two, four, okay? This is a function. And when we extend the input, we'll add a three here, the program starts running again. It starts up again. Uh, more information arrives. But then if we have one, two, three, and it stops, then eventually the program will start up again, but eventually it will stop again, and it will give a final result. So each time we add information, uh, to the input, the program can start up again, but only uh, for a little while, and then it actually terminates again. So there's many possible terminations, okay? You give it a little bit of information, it does a little bit of computation, and it stops. You give it a little more information, it starts up again, keeps going, but it will stop again, okay? That means if you give a certain amount of information, the program will always stop. So that's the first thing, okay? So this way, in this way, we can handle a stream computation as if it were functional, okay? Uh, each time we give an input here, it's like one function call. We give a little bit more input, it's like another function call, okay? So it's like we have many successive <coughs> function calls, and each one of these calls, we can apply the church roster, okay? So that means we can extend declarative concurrency here to the case of streams, when the program never really stops. It always can keep going, huh? Whereas on the left here, it's like very simple. You have an expression and it stops, huh? Okay? So that's the first thing. So with partial termination, we handle the case of streams. But there's another problem here, because we have the data flow variables, the single assignment variables, uh, the single assignment. So here we have, in the lambda calculus, all the uh, expressions or values. We never have unbound variable that we can bind, okay? But the data flow does not hurt the declarative programs. Uh, data flow variables are single assignment, so they're still functional, okay? They, they only, they will never be assigned more than once. So how do we express that? So, so, in some sense, it's still functional programming. But how do we express it? How do we make this idea precise? Well, for example, so there's many examples, but let me see if I can have a simple one. I have uh, a concurrent program with data flow variables and it binds the variables, okay? So let's say I have a program. So here's an example. I have a program. I have thread x equal foo uh, z w and thread y equal foo. It's kind of an artificial example, but it shows the principle thread x equal y. Okay? So this is an example of a declarative concurrent program. 
So I have three, I have two variables, x and y. I bind x to this record, foo z w, I bind y to foo z w, and then I also bind x equal y in three threads. Now how does this execute? Well, it's a concurrent program, so there's a scheduler, so it can execute in different ways. So for example, in one execution, the first two threads will execute first, and the last thread will execute at the end. So let me call this one T2, T2, T3. So T1, T2 executes first, and T3 at the end. So what does this give? So in memory, so if T1 and T2 execute first, in memory there are variables. Huh? So I'm looking at the memory, foo of ZW, foo of ZW. And then I execute T3. Well, T3 will bind X and Y, but X and Y are already bound, so it will just make sure that they're still equal. Is X equal to Y? So foo ZW, foo ZW is equal. So the bindings will be this in the store, okay? This is in the store. So this is fine, uh, this is the result. X and Y are both bound. But it might be that it executes in a different order, okay? It might be that we have T1 and T3 first, and then T2 at the end, okay? So if we do T1, Let's say T1 first, then we have x equal to foo zw. If we then execute T3, this one will bind y, okay? y will be bound to x. And then if we execute T2, y is equal to foo zw. y is equal to x, x is equal to foo zw, so it's okay. Okay, so we get this in the store. So you see, the two stores, they look different. The bindings are different. x equal foo, y equal foo, and here it's x equal foo and y equal x. And you can only bind them then once, huh? each variable. So it depends on the scheduler. So it looks, oh, terrible. It looks like it's not declarative anymore because we have two different results. Remember I said that a declarative program is deterministic. It's always the same result. But in fact, these two are not different. They are the same. They are actually the same value. In both of them, x is equal to foo zw, and y is equal to foo zw. And here also, y is equal to x and x, so y is also equal to foo zw. Now these are equalities, huh? mathematical equalities. So we need to define that, okay? So let me say then how it works. How do we define it? Actually, we can say that these two stores, we can say that they are logically equivalent. So we have to find a way to express that these are actually the same, okay? So they are the same, huh? It's just that the bindings are different, so the bindings, the actual bindings are different, but the values of x and y are actually the same, okay, the possible values. So if we introduce data flow variables, it seems like the results are different, because the, act, the bindings in the store can be different, but in fact, the bindings is not the important thing. It's the values of the variables. So x and y in both of these stores are the same. Okay? So let me call this, so this store is sigma one, this store is sigma two. Okay, two stores. So let me call this uh, sigma one, is equal to x equal foo zw and so I write it in a logical way y equal foo zw 
So this is actually a logical expression in first order logic. So I'm not going to make a course on logic, but I want to just explain how we can make them be the same, because they're actually the same. And sigma 2 is x equal foo cw and y equal x. So these two expressions are actually logical expressions that constrain the variable. So they determine what the possible values are. So x has to be a record foo with two arguments. Uh, and it's the same in both. Y is a record, foo with two arguments, and in the second one, it's also a record. Y is equal to X, and X is equal to foo, so Y in the second one is also a record, okay, with two arguments. And Z and W are unbound, so they can be anything. In both of them, they can be anything, okay? Any, we don't know they could be bound to any values, okay? Okay, now I need to make a little bit of room, so I will erase this part. <coughs> so we say, we say that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are logically equivalent because they express the same values. Because they express the same values. And I will make a definition of that. The same values. So the possible values of x and y and z and w here are the same in sigma 1 and sigma 2. Okay? So to really make the semantics of this, you have to talk about logic. So I don't know. Maybe some of you have seen first order logic. Have you? Are anyone here? In, I used to give a course in logic. Anyone has seen first order logic? Yes or no? No. No. There's also a cor course from Yves Deville, Calculabilité, where he talks a little bit about logic. But I'm not going to give a full course on logic. I just want to give you the basic idea here. Okay. So you can understand why that the data flow is still functional. Okay? So it's still functional because sigma 1 and sigma 2 express the same values. So we can actually make a formal definition of this. So there's different ways to do that. Huh? So I'm not going to introduce a formal course of logic. I just want to fix the idea so you understand why that the data flow variables are still functional, okay? So in order to define it, I introduce a function, values x sigma is the set of all possible values, set of all possible values of x, given the store sigma, given that the store is sigma. So, for example, values z of sigma 1 is all the possible minus. Huh? It's all possible values. Whereas values of x sigma 1, values x sigma 1, it's only, it's basically the set of all records of the form foo with two arguments. Huh? Values x of sigma 1, so in fact, the x in sigma 1 is always a record with two arguments, okay? But the same is the case for sigma 2. So you can say that um, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are logically equivalent if If there's two conditions. One, they have the same variables. They have the same variables in there. And two, for each of those variables, for each variable, V, we have values V 
sigma y is equal to values v sigma 2. So the v in this example will be x, y, z, and w. Huh? So for each of these variables, sigma 1 and sigma 2 give the same possible values. So then that means that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are actually equivalent. Okay. So basically, uh, to summarize it, when we add data flow variables to our functional language, the store bindings can be different, but they're still equivalent, okay? They can look different, but they still actually express the same values. So there's no difference in that. So I'm not going to make a proof, but it's, it's intuitive. And I just want to show you what it means here. Right? So no matter how the scheduler picks this, you, you might get different bindings of the variables, but, they, but it's always, each variable will also always have the same set of possibilities, okay? This, you can represent this also in logic, yeah? For those who know logic, you, it's something like this, okay? Uh, we have C1, uh, sigma 1, equivalent to sigma 2. So sigma 1 and sigma 2 are logical relations. So we have here, uh, so this is a logical formula that I'm just giving you for those who know logic. But I'm not going to show a course in logic. Just to tell you that logically what it means is that uh, for all possible values, so this means, okay, now I'm just telling you this is for information. Huh? In all possible models of this, that sigma 1 and sigma 2 are actually the same. They will be true for the same values. Okay, but forget that, okay? I'm just, that's just saying that there's some logic behind it. But I just want to tell you now that uh, it doesn't matter if the bindings are different because the values are the same, okay? Okay, so those are the two things. And now I can actually give you a definition a formal definition of declarative concurrency. <coughs> okay. So declarative concurrency. The definition of declarative concurrency. So we're going to use the logical equivalence and the partial. Termination. Now we can actually define it and we can move from Church Rosser to our declarative model. Okay? So a concurrent program, any concurrent program, is declarative if, if for all possible inputs, that it has, we have the following possibilities. Okay? All executions for a given set of inputs will either All executions will either not terminate, so they all go to infinite loops, <coughs> or they all they terminate. So they sorry they reach partial they reach partial termination, with the outputs are logically equivalent, and results are logically equivalent. Okay, so this is the definition. So I take any concurrent program, you write in any language you want, I say it's declarative if for all possible inputs, uh, for a given set of inputs, I look at the, all the executions, either all the executions will go into infinite loops, all of them, it's not just some, but all of them go into infinite loops, or 
all of them reach partial termination, and in each partial termination there's a logic equivalent. So basically, what I'm saying is that it's deterministic here. Huh? It's just a way of saying it's deterministic. So that means either it's going to go into an infinite loop, and then you know it's always going into an infinite loop, huh? or it actually reaches partial termination, and the outputs are equivalent. Okay? The bindings in the store might be different, but they are logically equivalent. Okay? So basically what I'm, say what I'm saying here, this is actually a formal way of saying that there's no observable non-determinism. Okay? So in the previous course, in the previous uh, uh, lectures, I keep saying that it's deterministic, that there's no observable non-determinism. That means when you run programs, you're always getting the same result. Well, that, what that means is this, okay? This is the precise meaning of that. So I'm giving you this precise meaning so that you can stand on the solid ground, okay? If there's any doubt of what happens with streams or with unbound variables, this definition makes it clear, okay? Okay, so that's one thing. And now, now I want to say something about programming techniques, application techniques with this. So when you write an application, so now I'm giving you advice. When, I, when you write an application, it should be as declarative as possible. Okay? That's my advice to you later. Because when you make it non-declarative, <laughs> then it gets much, much harder. The fact that you have no observable non-determinism makes things very easy. Okay, so that's the general advice. But sometimes, sometimes a program will become non-declarative. And how do you fix it? So how do you fix it? So that's what I want to give now an example of that. Okay, let's say I have program thread x equal 1 and thread y equal 2 and thread x equal y oops and so this is like a program I guess you could say it has a bug somewhere in there huh? Huh? because there's no way you can do all three bindings x equal 1 y equal 2, but x is not equal to y, and you can only bind once. So what happens when you run this? What happens practically? Because there's no way this can run declaratively. So it hits, it hits some kind of a, a, bo a, a, a wall, okay? This is no way you can run this declaratively. So what happens when you run it, when you actually run it? Well, the way that it runs in a practical system like Mozart is Mozart is a multi-paradigm system. It also does non-declarative things. So Mozart will not crash or blow up or anything like that, but it will raise an exception. Okay? So it basically <coughs> signals that it's no longer declarative. So it raises an exception to say it's no longer declarative. And in fact, the scores could be different. Huh? So uh, depending on how the scheduler picks it, maybe x will be equal to 1, y is equal to 2, and then I do this, boom, exception. Or maybe I have x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, and I have an exception. Or maybe I have x equal to 2, y equal to 2, so this is all, these are all possible stores. Depending on how the scheduler picks these three threads, I can have different stores. And then when it hits 
the contradiction, it raises an exception. So here I do x equal 1, y equal 2, and then I try to do x equal y, I raise an exception. Or here I do x equal 1, x equal y, and then I try to do y equals 2, exception. And here I do x equal, y equal 2, x equal y, and then I try to do x equal 1, exception. So all three are possible. So this is basically non-deterministic, yeah? The stores are different. So the whole thing is non-deterministic. So I'm not declarative anymore. Okay? Non-determinism, it, I, I have observable non-determinism now. It's not declarative anymore. Okay? So what do I do in this case? So let me uh, explain. What does the programmer do in this case? So here I have basically left, I leave the declarative model, or the declarative paradigm. See here I'm leaving the declarative model. So after I do this, it's not declarative anymore. But that's kind of a bummer because you want your application to be declarative. So when you introduce this kind of a non-determinism, you want to you want to tame it, you want to capture it, okay? So basically what you do is, what we want to do, we want to go back. So this is uh, EF, we want, to go, we want to go back to the declarative model. So how do we go back? Once we have done this, we have non-determinism, it's terrible. We broke, we break our beautiful declarative program. But the way to go back is to use a technique called failure confinement. The idea is to hide the non-determinism. We want to hide it. And it's just a programming technique based on exception handling. So we use the exceptions. Huh? We use the exceptions that are raised. So when this happens, the Mozart system will keep running. It just keeps running. It's just not declarative anymore. But it will keep running in a non-declarative paradigm. So we can actually write the program so that it goes back into the declarative by hiding the non-determinism. So if we do this, for example, let me show with this example, okay, let me do it in different colors. So we want to hide this, we want to hide these three stores. So how do we hide it? Actually, it's very simple. We have two variables, x and y. So x and y are the global ones, the visible ones. And so these have to be bound deterministically, okay? Well, we introduce new variables. Let me call it x1 and y1, which are local and possibly non-deterministic. So the code is actually very simple. Let me show you how it works. And we use exception handling. So we have x equal 1, x1 equal 1, y1, y1 equal 2, x1 equal y1. <coughs> this is the program, huh? This is my program that actually gave a problem. And this is running in a thread, thread end, the first one, thread end, the second one, and thread end. I make some space because I'm going to add some code. Huh? And then we add some code here. We actually catch the exception. Sorry, we have a try. Try. Catch. Then, and then there's an error. This is a signal. OK? 
Okay. Here we say S1 is okay. Okay. So um, S1 error. But otherwise we have S1 is equal to okay. Uh, and here we have another try. Catch. Then S2 is equal to an error. And here we have a third one. S3 equals OK. Catch. Then S3 equals error. So basically, we, we use the exception handling to catch the exception, to catch the error. And then at the end, after executing this, we, we check if see if there's an error. If S1 is equal to error, or S2 is equal to error, or S3 is equal to error, then, then there's an error. Else, okay, and now what we do is we can define our x and y. The global ones. Okay, if there's no error, x will be equal to x1 and y is equal to y1. Whereas if there's an error, we can actually hide it by giving the same value. So for example, we say there's a default value which is 1, 1 in the case there's an error. Okay, so this is kind of a, a technique for going when you go out of the declarative model to hide the non-determinism and go back in. You see, now we're, we're getting really into nitty gritty stuff here. Huh? But the important thing is once you do this, the rest of the program is still declarative. Okay? So this is called failure confinement. So basically we want to hide the non-determinism. Okay, so that's basically uh, the technique that I want to show. So if you somehow have an error and you leave, you introduce some non-determinism. You can actually hide it. In this case, I'm using the exception handler, but there's other ways to hide. You just want to make sure that the rest of the program does not seek the non-determinism. Okay. okay, so let me now finish. So this is all I want to say about declarative concurrency. So you know what it means with the definition, huh? and you know that you want to hide non-determinism if your program is actually has a bug and shows non-determinism. Let me finish by explaining all the possible paradigms. Okay. So one of the things I want to do in this course is to show all possible paradigms. So let's take a look at all declarative programming paradigms and the programming languages that use them. So we have actually, so we make a table here. There's actually six possibilities. <coughs> So here we have eager, this is the non-lazy, then we have lazy, here we have sequential functional programming, here we have sequential functional programming with data flow variables, and here we have concurrent functional programming with data flow variables. So each of these boxes, there's some programming languages in there. Okay. So the first box is the simplest one, 
This is sometimes called script functional programming. And you can have languages like Scheme and ML are in there. Okay. The second box is called Lazy. And the most popular language in here is called Haskell. Okay. And now these models they get more, more. Uh, there's not so many languages that do these models. Okay. So this is the model of chapter two in the book. You can also see this as the as the prologue language but only the deterministic subset. This is kind of exotic. Huh? So Prolog is a logic programming language, and it can do search, but if you look at the deterministic subset of Prolog, it actually fits here. Okay, And here we have lazy functional programming with data flow. And here, again, Prolog is the only one that has something here. It basically, the co-routining subset of Prolog does this. And now let's go to concurrent functional programming. Here we have a model that you know very well, <coughs> you should know very well, our deterministic data flow model. And actually, a lot of the cloud tools are here. MapReduce, Apache Flink, which is a cloud analytics tool, they are sitting here. Okay? And the most general one is the lazy deterministic data flow model, which we saw last week. This is section 451 in the book. Actually, there's no languages, really, except for us, which is an experimental education language that supports this. Okay, This one is not so much used, but maybe in the future it will be more used. So <coughs> here, I can make some comments on this. This is actually an interesting diagram. So these are actually the classic functional languages. Huh? So Scheme is actually a form of Lisp. You heard of Lisp. Uh, Haskell is actually a very popular language used uh, in the functional programming community today because of the laziness. But these are kind of traditional languages. Here we are getting into <coughs> cloud analytics platforms. Okay. So these platforms are functional, but also concurrent. So the idea is that they're functional plus concurrent. Why is that so important? Functional, that makes it easy to test, debug, write programs. Uh, and concurrent. It's because they run on the cloud. It's because they run on many, many systems. This is actually because of the distributed implementation. Because they're running on many <coughs> nodes. They run on many, many nodes that communicate together. So how do you write a program that runs on 100 nodes and it's still efficient. Well, the only way to really make it work is to make it functional. So the cloud has sort of migrated to this box, okay? Because you need it, you need one, you need it easy to program, but you also need speed. So that's why they run on many nodes. So you need this. You need to combine these two. And the only way that it really works is in deterministic data flow, okay? And maybe in the future they will migrate to this. Maybe. That's my guess. So this diagram is kind of giving you a view of the future paradigms. Huh? In this course, 
I'm not just giving you programming techniques. I try to give you an overview of things that happen, of many things. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, traditional functional languages are here. Sequential functional data blow is not so much used. It actually fits more in terms of uh, the logic, logic programming, programming style. Uh -huh. So this is not so much used. And then the third one, concurrent functional programming, which is always based on data flow. That's the way to make it really work well. This is where the cloud tools are coming here. That's very interesting, actually. So the cloud tools have come here, and probably in the future they will become more lazy. That's my guess, because the laziness is a way to make them more efficient. Okay? Some of them maybe are already a little bit going in this direction. Okay? Okay, let me now explain one more thing here, just to, to organize this diagram. So there's an organizing principle of this. So when I have a variable, in a, a data flow variable, okay, in a language, in a functional language, in general, a data flow variable, there's actually three special times in the lifetime of this variable. There's the first time is when I declare it, when I create it. The second special part of the lifetime of this variable is when I specify the function that will compute its value. To compute its value. And the third moment is when I actually evaluate that function, okay? Maybe I don't do it right away. So there are three moments in the lifetime of a variable, okay? So why am I defining these three moments? Because all of these different paradigms can be organized in this way. So the first box, <coughs> the one plus two and plus three are all together. You declare a variable and you immediately <coughs> specify and run the function. Uh, for example, I do, I do uh, x is equal to y squared. Boom, right away. I define x, I call y squared, and I bind. So the three of them are together here. Okay. Whereas in the lazy case, the third one is separate. You understand it, huh? I first specify the function, but I don't evaluate it yet. I only evaluate it when it's needed. So 1 plus 2 are together, but 3 is separate. Okay? And here in the uh, concurrent functional programming with data flow, this is not lazy. So I declare the variable first, one, and I evaluate it later. So I can have unbound variables. So the declaration can be done before I specify the function. So we use that. Huh? You can put a hole inside of a data structure and pass it on somewhere else and bind it later. Okay? Whereas this third one is the most general. All three of the steps are separated. This is the most general declarative paradigm. And it's still not so much used, okay? So, in some sense, this lets you look into the future. So, when, when, when this book was published, when this thing was published in 2004, that's a long time ago, huh? Then, the, the data flow analytics was not really a big thing in those days. But they were coming up. They come up, like starting 2010 and so on, you have these cloud analytics, and they moved here, okay? They come here, a system like Apache Flink. Uh -huh. So the cloud analytics, they came here. So in some sense, it lets you see into the future. 
So the, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? So what I think is going to happen is that things are going to go, is going to become more lazy. So these platforms will start becoming more lazy. And the reason is performance, because the lazy lets you do the minimum amount of computation, and only it's on demand. Like in the lazy quick sort, huh? uh, you have the smallest k elements, but k is not known in advance. That means the person querying the system can ask for more information, and the system will compute the analytics only when the person is asking. So that way, it's much more efficient. Huh? So the idea is that things like lazy quicksort will be also used in cloud platforms. So my suggestion for you now is to follow the course on cloud computing. And you will learn now all of this. Huh? And you will see how some of these platforms are maybe becoming more demand-driven, huh? more lazy. Okay. Okay, so there, let me end for today now. So today's course was very conceptual, huh? and maybe you are scared that I'm going to be very conceptual. But actually, it's the only one. Starting next week, we start writing code again. Huh? So the rest of the course will be code. Huh? So I apologize for people who only want to see code for this today course, but... Uh, <coughs> I think it's important that you do more than just see code, that you also can think about what's going to happen in the future. Okay? So I try to give you the 